who am I? If I'm not acting, if I'm not on stage, then how can I be an actor? What, what does it even mean? These kind of roles allow us to kind of bring out a naughty part of ourselves. There's a very common thread that comes through all of this and how we go about making it becomes very different. Hello and welcome to the Theatre Art Life podcast, sponsored by Harlequin Floors, the world leader in floors, stage systems and studio equipment for the performing arts. Our podcast puts the spotlight on those who create live entertainment around the world, the culture creators, the backstage masters. My name is Anna Rob. And my name is Anna Aguilera. On this episode, we're talking to Patrick Oliver Jones, who's joining us to talk about his acting career. Born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, and now living in New York, Patrick brought his southern charm to this northern way of life, as well as his career in the entertainment industry. From theatre and voiceovers to short films and podcasting, Patrick has been blessed with a multitude of opportunities in show business. And then came COVID, and Patrick had to explore new ventures and outlets for his creativity. And through this, Patrick is learning it's not about the destination, but the experience. And it's certainly been an adventure so far. Patrick, welcome to Theatre Out Life podcast. So happy to be here. I've uh, followed your publication for a while online, and so it's a, it's a joy to speak to you both. It's amazing. So um, I, I'm going to jump right into your podcast because we're, we're fellow podcasters. I know I'm kind of jumping the gun on maybe the agenda. But um, what was the impetus to start your own podcast as an actor and as a performer? Well, it really just came from me listening to other podcasts. Uh, specifically, I, I think I can name it here, but it was called My Dad Wrote a Porno. A very, a very oh, funny title, but one but, of my but, favorite yeah. podcasts right? of all time. Seriously, have you but, listened to it? But Anna? if these yeah, yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's such a random podcast, but it's it these three people talking about one, one of the, the main podcaster, his dad actually wrote a porn novel, erotic literature. So they just talk about it. And I thought, if these people can banter back and forth, I think I could do that. That could be fun. So I got together with an actor friend of mine and really it just came from wanting to to banter and talk about what we originally what we focused on was theater, but it was really just a chance to to converse and and just kind of talk about the business. And so that it was a very meager beginnings, kind of just a fun way, a lighthearted way to talk about the business. And so then we came up with the title, Why I'll Never Make It, which actually came from kind of, uh, I, I guess, getting other people's opinion, because we did this pilot episode with different sections, and that was just one of the sections, but people resonated with it who listened to it. They resonated with this section called Why I'll Never Make It So Much, so we broadened out the whole podcast to just focus on on that one issue. So we brought on people to talk about their challenges and their setbacks, and uh, but we tried to do it in a lighthearted way. And I think that first season was was us finding our feet. Now, he eventually, my co-host, left after that second season. And so I've been taking it on. But overall, that message of what we go through and how we persevere through the different hurdles is still the main thrust of the podcast. Mm. And like you said, it's such a common thread from most performers. And New York is one of those places where people go to try and make it in numerous realms of entertainment. I mean, it has that reputation, but that's not only isolated to New York. It's just, it, it's everywhere, really. It's, it's, it's a tough, tough industry overall, right? Is that what you've learned in the podcast in terms of your, all of your interviews and your engagement with people in the industry? Definitely, because I've brought on people from Broadway as well as regional theaters. And so it's a wide mix of people, even though I think most of my audience, and certainly I live in New York, so I think that I have that bent, but I have been reached out to, from listeners from, you know, middle of America to the West Coast and everywhere in between that tend to resonate with it in a sense of what one of my favorites, it was this girl who wrote to me and she said that she's just graduating and she's been listening to the podcast and it gives her this kind of real world perspective of what she's getting into, which to me is one of the biggest benefits of this podcast. And especially for those newer to the business that it can give them kind of a, an eye opening journey into what they're, what they're getting into. There's a lot of wonderful things that can happen. A lot of, you know, amazing journeys and performers that we can meet along the way, but it's, it's going to have those tough moments. And I think it's important that 
especially those starting out, know that know what they're getting into. It's not only a myth, right? That <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> what have you really, besides being able to share and understand what other people go through? Uh, at, I guess at a human level, what has, have you learned from the podcast? Or maybe on a technical level, what have been the lessons from the, <laughs> from the podcast? Well, my degree, my background is in broadcasting. So I kind of knew a lot of the technical stuff as far as video editing, audio editing. So I had some uh, history with that. So the technical aspects weren't the hardest part to learn from the podcast itself. It really came down to and I think this is what producers go through. It's getting butts in the seats or for podcasting, getting people's earbuds in, you know, actually finding listeners. And that I think is really the, one of the hardest things when it comes to producing a podcast is reaching out, getting those listeners and just being known. And I spend as much, if not more time, marketing, posting, press releases, just all that that gets into just having people find these wonderful conversations that I have. So I think that was the biggest lesson that I got from it on that side. As far as artistically, I knew that I was going to be talking with people. And one of my missions with the podcast is to let others, let listeners know they're not alone, let other artists know that we're in this together and there's a commonality that we have. But one of the things that I learned, I don't think I was aware of, of how different we all are, yet that commonality remains. Meaning someone's on Broadway, they still have to like figure out what their next job's going to be because the Broadway show ends. Someone in regional theater who's, who's just kind of getting started, they have their own joys, but at the same time, they're worried where their next job is going to be. So there's, there's a very common thread that comes through all of this. And how we go about, quote unquote, making it becomes very different. And I think that that, that was that was a surprising bent that my podcast took because I was like, well, why I'll never make it? You know, I have these reasons why I'm not going to be this big star. Great. But what I didn't realize, and this is what I learned from my from the guests that I brought on, is that making it changes throughout our time as an artist, that what we wanted when we got out of college, making it meant something very different. When you're 10 years, 20 years, 30 years into your career, making it now takes on a different definition. It, it, it looks different. I know for myself, I, I, I try to incorporate myself into these conversations. And, you know, my audience certainly knows that I came to New York with the Broadway goal. That was what I wanted to do. That was making it to me. But in these 13 years, still not on Broadway, my definition of making it has changed. And I had to come to terms with the fact that if I don't get to Broadway, that doesn't mean I'm a failure as an artist. I can make it in other ways. And I've had to find joy and purpose in other avenues that since I haven't gotten Broadway, that you know I haven't checked that box, that I've had to find other ways to, to quote unquote make it. And I think that it's been as much a journey for me as it is for the guests that I bring on. Oh, that's so interesting. So if we rewind, you know, you said you've been in broadcasting, but you're also an actor. And like, so where, where did it all begin in Birmingham, Alabama? And, and how did you get into the arts? What was that path? Well, I originally started in church choirs and church musicals. And so that was my first introduction. My, my mother was in the adult choir. So then I started doing children's choir, just more as an activity because in school, you know, we had music class and along as long with the with other classes. And but I really took to the music education of learning what a quarter note was and holding breaths and what, what the different symbols meant, as well as then just singing these different songs and how to bring, you know, 30 kids together and sing one song. So I enjoyed that part. So that I thought, well, I'll, I'll do it for church as well. Started getting into musicals. And in the fourth grade, I was the shepherd boy going to the manger, you know, for our, for our Christmas, uh, Christmas presentation. And that was really my first time to sing alone on a stage and hear that audience reaction to that. And I think, you know, th th there's always a bit of, I guess, selfishness or loving the, the applause that, that I think every actor goes through in the beginning. And so I really loved that interaction with an audience that like, oh, they like what I'm singing or what I'm saying, or, you know, I made them laugh. 
so that's really where it got started. And then I started doing school plays and and different things. And from there, I you know joined my thespian society when I was in high school, and it just progressed on through college. Now, I thought about a theater degree itself, but that whatever reason, there's that voice of, well, I, I should probably have a backup degree or, you know, something real, quote unquote, to uh, to major in. So I, I did the the major in broadcasting because I had uh, also been working in audiovisual stuff, uh, again, through my church and doing that. So that was like, well, I do enjoy doing this. So I'll get a degree in that. But I still minored in theater and vocal performance. So I didn't leave that behind at all. Mm. And what does it mean to you now, acting? That's a big question. It's a simple question that you ask, but it's a it's a big one. <laughs> what what it, what it means to me now is really a chance to connect, and I think that's one of the biggest things that I have gotten over the years from being an actor is that certainly I love embodying a character. I love dissecting the the songs, the lyrics, the scenes, the, you know, since I'm in musical theater, I get to kind of have a wide gamut of, of different performance options and different characters and pop music to classical music to, you know, whatever kind of genre it is. But what I've really, I think what, what I really honed in on as I keep going is that what I love is doing that scene with someone else. I love, again, going back to, to my fourth grade, I love hearing that audience laugh or <gasps> gasp at a certain moment. I, I love the, the, the liveness that theater provides, that there's 100 people, 1,000 people, however many are in the theater, that it's a shared experience and it's something that we're all connecting with, even for those two hours that we're together. And that is what continually feeds me as far as being an actor. Do you think that's something that is kind of innate in you as or artists generally as a person? Because when you talk about that, I think about my, when I was a kid, I was on stage and I don't ever remember enjoying it, but I've spent my life backstage. <laughs> and I think I went on stage because I didn't know that there was a whole backstage world that existed, right? So it kind of fascinates to me that you like that and you enjoy that. Do you think that's innate or is that something, like how does that is that just a different personality? I just, well, I wonder your thoughts on that because I know for me, I don't remember it ever being a pleasant experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is interesting because th th there is that nervousness. I, I remember, you know, going back to that, that fourth grade performance when I was the shepherd boy, one of the things that I ran down the aisle, you know, as, as like I was finding the manger and then I got on stage and started singing. Well, I was completely out of breath whenever I was singing, I just remember performing and I was like, oh, I got to keep singing. What about, you know, so there's, there's a nervousness, there's a, uh, the things happen that you don't expect. So I, I do think there is something innate within certain artists that lead them toward being on stage versus being backstage versus television versus theater. So I, I, I do think that there is something innate that happens that kind of it flips a switch, so to speak, in certain people, and and it doesn't. I've I've even spoken to people on my podcast who weren't really into acting or or performing. There, there was a a Broadway actress that I spoke to, and she said, "I really didn't care for musical theater." Now she has a beautiful voice, you know, has has been nominated for a Tony Award, but yet she was like, "When I began, I didn't care for musical theater." So I I I th I, th I think there's 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 different points in our life and depending on where we are that we kind of can just fall into this business. And, and I think it, for those people that it resonates with, like, like myself, I gravitated toward that stage and that's where I love to do for, for you. Once you discovered backstage, you're like, Oh my gosh, I can still do artistic things and not have people looking at me. Great. You know, so we, we all kind of find, we find our ways to, to still be creative. Yeah. I remember my dad, I, a similar story to you was some sort of, primary school production and I was Jack in Jack and the Beanstalk 
And uh, my dad said I was a stage manager before we even knew what a stage manager was because I not only knew my lines but I knew everybody else on the stage's lines. And so when everybody forgot, I was, like, directing them and managing them on the stage. And my dad just remembers, like, laughing the whole show because he's, like, this little girl, like, managing the entire cast on the stage more than acting. So that that was there from the beginning, which I think is an amazing story because, yeah, acting was definitely not for me, that's for sure. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because for me, the backstage certainly in college, we, you know, being a, a theater minor, I was a major for a semester, but then I would change it to a minor. But being part of that, you had to do backstage work. You had to help with the props or the sets or do whatever, as well as being on stage. So I got interest. I got introduced to it there. But it was really with my college. There was a performing arts venue that would bring in tours or different concerts. And I became a part of that stage crew for that concert hall. And that's really, I think where I really learned the ins and outs of, of what it takes to run a backstage and all the work that goes into what you see on stage is certainly one thing, but there's the lighting and the, and the sets and the, the technical aspects that, that are so precise and just as creative, even though they're technical, they're just as creative and there's still a lot of, of, uh, of of artistic play with it that happens backstage, and I think that's where I really learned, uh, at least got a broader sense of the the complete picture of what it takes to put on a production. Hmm. I'm curious now, since Anna and I don't enjoy being on stage, but we clearly <laughs> kind of are right now. What was your feeling about being backstage? <laughs> Well, uh, well, how do I feel about being backstage? Well, it it is interesting because I I remember you know doing doing sound or doing spotlights for different productions, and you know I I felt like I was I was good at what I did, and I did enjoy the act of of, of getting the right sound, and you know sometimes the smallest things when you're a spotlight operator. Your spotlight isn't on, you're moving, and then you know at this particular moment you have to click it on and be right on their face. And that was always like the, if, if you could do that, it just kind of gauge it, flip the switch, and you were boom, right on their face when they started singing, then you did your job. Sometimes, you know, you had to move it around and then, oh, okay, all right, fix it for next time. So there's these little joys and almost kind of games that you can play to, to keep it interesting and creative. But even even still, when I'm behind the board or behind the spotlight or whatever I'm working on, I still look at the people on stage going, oh, that looks, oh, 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 oh my gosh, why are they, I would totally do something different. Or, oh my gosh, I would love to perform with that person. I mean, it, it, the, the I'm still in my uh, either actor slash director mode of wanting to be on stage and doing something. So I, I think that's, that, that's, that's how I know that that's more my bent, even though I, I feel technically proficient in the other you know and it's so help, helpful and healthy to have an understanding and comprehension of both sides I think especially as an artist because you have then respect for you know the time it might take or the technical requirements and 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 working as a team and that's what I think is what quite wonderful about theatrical creation is that like we're all very different in our skill sets yet we come together and create this alchemy that creates a show and there's not a lot of industries where everybody comes from such different uh, expertise and then works together in a very short quick amount of time I mean I'm sure there's comparisons that we can make in other industries but it's quite a unique experience in that sense so I mean in in terms of your and your you know you said you never made it to Broadway but you've you've had a, a definitive art career in the arts what would you advise people in terms of people who are coming into the industry who have their sights set on Broadway or want to have a career in the arts in terms of finding their own purpose and their own holistic um, satisfaction in job career? Well, one of the things that, again, we were talking about lessons I've learned from the podcast and in speaking with the guests that I brought on, one of the biggest distinctions that I have been shown is that there's a difference between having a goal and having a purpose. And while goals can help fulfill our purpose, they are not the purpose in and of themselves. For example, my goal of Broadway, it's a, it's a wonderful goal. And I think that there are a lot of people who come to New York with that goal. But as I've been here, as I've come to learn, that ultimately isn't my purpose as an actor. It is merely one facet of what I hope to do. 
But my purpose as an actor is to, again, going back to that connection, both with artists on stage or backstage, with the audience, connecting with the character and imbibing it with as much personality and depth as I can. So there's there's these other purposes that I have as an artist that aren't that have nothing to do with Broadway. And so I think if I could impart that to people starting out, that your journey will change and, and recognize and go for goal. I, I, th- I think it is important to have those goals. So I'm not certainly not dismissing that and saying that they're not relevant or important. It is important to have those goals because you, you need to have markers along the way and kind of these anchor points that I'm shooting for something, I'm pushing forward in this direction. But don't let it be so singularly focused that you that you lose sight of the the other things that are going to happen along your journey and i think if you can not not have not have the blinders on too much but you can kind of broaden out and uh and see a fuller picture as you go toward your different goals then i think it'll it'll just help you whether or not you achieve those goals it'll it'll just help you in the the broader sense of being an artist and now a moment for our sponsor The Theatre Art Life podcast is proud to be sponsored by Harlequin. Harlequin is the world leader in floors, stage systems and studio equipment for the performing arts. Established in the UK over 40 years ago, Harlequin is the preferred performance floor for the world's most prestigious dance and performing arts companies, theatres and schools. From the Royal Opera House to the Bolshoi Theatre, the New York City Ballet to the Royal New Zealand Ballet. Harlequin's experience and reputation are founded on the development, manufacture and supply of a range of high-quality sprung and vinyl floors specifically designed for dance and the performing arts. Backed by an engineering team and independent research, Harlequin also designs, builds and refurbishes stages working with stage engineers and theatre consultants in leading venues across the world. Harlequin is the global leader in its field with offices in Europe, the Americas and Asia-Pacific. Find out more at harlequinfloors.com, H-A-R-L-E-Q-U-I-N floors.com. It's a tough work on self-knowing or getting to know yourself and what really. And so I, want, I, I guess that helped you define what success meant to you and adapt it through time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it goes back to that, uh, that idea of making it and what success means and that that too has changed over time slightly you know so that it's not just having a broadway career that success is getting to because i i've done shows in a regional theater for 300 a week you know broadway they make 2000 minimum a week but even 300 a week i was able to do a role that i loved that i was that i i put my heart and soul into and so that was a successful venture for the month that I was there performing that show. And so success, I I think as long as you're, and I think we as artists have a slightly better grasp at this, maybe than some nine to five office jobs, because there, there, there's this, the corporate ladder is so well defined that you can see either you're progressing or you're not, you're either (laughs) getting promoted or you're staying stuck. Whereas in, in, in the arts, it's so fluid that you're you're making this amount and one you're you're an ensemble understudy and then you're a lead and then you're you're back to maybe being a director maybe you know the different facets that you can that you can take on in this business and i think that it's that variety that that's really going to uh to define your success you know whatever that's going to mean to you and you're going to be ha- have to be happy with bouncing from that level of notoriety i guess right if you're going to go from the ensemble to a lead then back to the ensemble like that's that's a creative life really isn't it yeah and it's i I think it's one of the the hardest things to to recognize because we want to progress you know obviously coming out out of college you know you're going to be in a lot of ensembles but you hope to then get a supporting and then maybe a bigger supporting and then a lead role and then you know you're the love interest and that you know you you want to progress upward as an actor but i think one of the one of the things i've had to learn is that i can go from being man of la mancha don quixote in one production to then being chorus member to the left in the next production (laughs) you know and there there is still it it really it really takes creativity to make both of those 
way out in the end and to be just as important and to give just as much to both. And I think that it, it, it is difficult because I, I know that I've been, I've been uh, down on myself. I've been down on a production because, well, they're not realizing how good I am or I, I could be doing so much better. I've, I've had to deal with the, with that inner voice telling me that I'm either better than I am or worse than I am. And it's a matter of finding that balance constantly of recognizing, well, for this production, this is where I fit in. This is the this is what I can bring to this production. Like I'm I'm going to be performing this summer, thankfully, after two years of of, of being away from COVID because of COVID. But it's going to be an ensemble role. But I'll have a couple of moments of sticking out as as this character, and then I'll then I'll do another character. And Yes, it would be great to have a lead role, but I know that I can fulfill these particular characters, these smaller roles, in a way that uh, the other people who auditioned didn't. And so there's still a satisfaction that can come because we're constantly being chosen and not chosen. But when you are chosen to be on stage, it's something to be grateful for and relish and really just give your all to. You just mentioned COVID and and my gosh, it's been so different for so many people around the world, that experience. What, what was that like for you? Because in your bio we say, you know, you explored new ventures and new outlets for creativity. And I feel like some people did really take an opportunity during this time to reassess and and, and do exactly what you may say of, say you did in terms of new ventures and, and new outlets for creativity. So what were they and and what was COVID like for you? Well, I was actually on a cruise ship when it was all kind of happening in, you know, January. Oh, the, God, the you like stuck out at sea? But, 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 but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like, on that ship, like, our ship never got COVID. So, you know, we were hearing the horror stories of other cruise ships that were getting it. But uh, we, were, we were safe, fortunately for us. But we, but we heard the stories January, February. And then at the beginning of March, it was starting to ramp up. And we're like, oh, gosh, what's going to happen? And we weren't really sure. And then the the week that Broadway shut down is also the week that we found out through CNN, not from our management, but from CNN, that our cruise ship was going to be closing down, right? And so they, you know, we ported in Los Angeles and I got to, to go home. And it was about, uh, I want to say it was two or three weeks early. So the, the contract that we had uh, it, yeah, it ended about two or three weeks early because of COVID, because of the shutdown. So I went from this very insulated environment where we were, you know, taking measures, cleaning and doing all the things, no COVID, to then coming to New York City, where it was like, everyone's just hunkered down, streets were empty. It was surreal to come back to that. And to see a city that with 8 million people bustling every day, to just being in a standstill. And it was really strange. And yeah, so for those for that summer, I was just in my apartment. I, I, I think I went out a couple of times to maybe just, you know, go to the store to buy this or buy that. But otherwise, didn't do anything. You know, as, as, as with everyone, we got to know Netflix and Hulu and all those streaming shows. And so for me, it was weird to not have not have the arts to to not even know when theater was going to be coming back anytime soon. And I, I did, I had to kind of figure out, well, well, who am I? If I'm not acting, if I'm not on stage, then how can I be an actor? What, what does it even mean? And fortunately I, I'd started the podcast in 2017. And so I, I kind of saw the podcast now as my stage and it took on a new life, a new personality, and also, again, going back to that, a new purpose, because it was my one way to produce. I, I, I branched out because before I was just doing audio, but then I wanted to incorporate video. So now I'm doing that and trying to produce different things. And I started doing bonus episodes and, and, and writing more blogs. So, so it, was, it was kind of this broad spectrum of like, well, let me just go you know 100% 110% into this podcast and see the different ways that it can branch out and television started to come back toward that fall and and winter of 2020 so i i, I did a couple of uh, of shows then but theater was still gone for me until as i said until this summer 
and I, I've, I started auditioning last fall, but you know, for whatever reason, it just wasn't happening. So that seeing on social media, Broadway's back and all, you know, friends of mine or people that I follow, Hey, I'm, I'm back in rehearsal. And, and they have their picture of the, of the, the binder, you know, Hey, look, I'm in a show. And so it, it was, it was tough to see, to see theater coming back, but I wasn't coming back. I was still, I, I was still where I was. And it was really hard to see this profession, this creativity that I love so much. In some ways, it felt like it was leaving me behind. Like, okay, it's a, it's progressing on and I'm just going to stay where I am. So it, it it was really difficult to not feel a part of this theater's back because I was just kind of watching it from the sidelines. So Still, I just had to persist, and um, that's, again, that's part of the creative journey of knowing that, all right, there's going to be 99 no's, I'm not going to book this audition, but I can only get that one if I keep auditioning, if I keep coming back. And uh, fortunately, I, I did, and, and I'm able to do this show this summer. Mm. So a little bit what you, I was reading uh, some of the material there's on you on, on the internet and you talk about the sense of belonging that attracted you to theater at the very beginning and then wrestling with it right now like <laughs> where where am i in this picture with this community with this uh, artistic pursuit yeah it has it has been a little lonely because i don't have that connection and certainly in the, in the, the big, very beginning of covid you know, we were all isolating ourselves uh, for medical reasons, but also artistically we had to, you know, we weren't able to produce the things that we were doing before. And so there, there has been a loneliness over the past couple of years that I didn't feel before, because even though, you know, because before I, auditioning is really the job of an actor, that's what we do, you know, most days of the week. And then whew, voila, we, we get cast and then we're gone for a couple of months, but then we come back to it. And we go through the whole process again. And to not have that progression, to not have all the auditions that I had before, to not have the, this outlet, it was, yeah, the, the, there was a part of me that was just not being fed at all. That was just, I, I was certainly feeding my body a lot and I gained 20 pounds during COVID. So, that, <laughs> <laughs> so there, was that, there was that part that I was overindulging in. And, and, and I'm sure psychologically, you know, I'm sure a, a, a psychologist would read into, well, you weren't feeding your soul, so you fed your belly. Great. <laughs> um, but uh, but, but as, as theater started to come back, I even realized that the auditioning didn't there wasn't a spark there there wasn't a drive to oh good i, I can audition for this show oh and it, like when it came back in that sense of auditioning i was i was hesitant i and, and i'm still trying to kind of parse through what exactly that means does that mean that maybe acting is going to diminish and i'll pick up another creative outlet i, I i'm not sure but it's certainly something that i'm working through as far as why auditioning doesn't hold the, the the spark that it used to for me and in, in in one little way i think it's because again this goes back to that goal versus purpose i think for so long i had the goals and so i knew how to audition i knew that to do this oh great now i'm getting this resume or, or this credit on my resume now i'm doing you know i saw the progression i saw getting closer to my goals and then once all that's stripped away and I can't go for those goals, then all I'm left is that purpose. And I think I hadn't nurtured that enough to know really what it was. And I think that COVID was a, a wake-up call to really figure out what that purpose is. And the podcast is certainly an outlet of that because I am able to reach people. I'm able to connect with, with the guests that I bring on, but also connect with listeners in a way that that is showing them I would like to think a more well-rounded picture of this business. So that's certainly become another purpose of mine in trying to, to reach audiences. So maybe there's more of that. Maybe there's more hosting or directing or producing that, uh, that can come out of that. Yeah. You know, I totally identify with that because I think COVID was a huge disruptor into this industry that we 
go, 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 you know, and, and we get so caught in that routine that we don't often spend time to sit back and reflect and question those motives. And 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 a lot of the time I think COVID has shifted a lot of people's perspective. I know that it has for me as well. You know, it's like, well, do I really need to go on that trip? Because I'd rather stay with my family. Do you know what I mean? Like let's question these things a little bit more rather than jumping on a plane and going, you know. So I think that's really interesting. But what I'm in much admiration for, which I think is different from what Anna and I do in the industry, is that the tenacity uh, in in terms of actors and performers in getting roles and, um, yes, you may be talented and you may be able to sing and you may be able to dance. And like we may be able to stage manage or we may be able to technically direct, but there's other factors in an actor's casting of a role, whether you're the right look or feel or the right thing in terms of the, in a way it's, it's, it's quite competitive in, in people going for that same role, right, rather than somebody signs me up for a job because of my experience. You have the same amount of experience, but that doesn't mean you're going to get that role, right? So I, I have much admiration for that tenacity and I can understand how that can be over time, you know, if you've had that break where you're like, do I really want to go into that lion's den of audition, 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 audition in that competition. So it's fascinating to me that you're, you know, you're open and honest about that experience because I think I have, I just think it's a tough life for most people who want to get into that industry. It's tough to be that resilient for that long, to continue to take those projects, start again, take those projects, the life of those projects come and go um, and it's a constant landing of the next one. So I yeah, so I just want—I just want to say that I think it's much. I'm in much admiration of that. <laughs> Thank you. And from an actor's perspective, in talking with people who work behind the stage, and it—it's interesting the because we have auditions. We have this 90 second way of showcasing our skills and hopefully getting call back and getting the job. Whereas behind the scenes, it's it really is a different field of of networking more. It's not like you're auditioning to be a stage manager. You worked with someone who worked with someone else and they need someone and then they contact you and talk to you and great, come on board. So it's a it's a different way of of showcasing yourself or proving yourself, you know, as a stage manager, as, as a lighting technician, whatever your your technical field is. Whereas for us actors, it it's almost like yes, there are those casting directors that see me time and time again. But with every new director, every new production, I'm kind of starting at square zero of I need to prove myself. Here's the voice I have. Here's what I do. Here's how I act. This is how I present a character. Callbacks. Uh, director does adjustments, gives me those things and plays with me and says, what can you do? And it is a sense of starting over again almost every time. Even the jobs we have, it's two, two three months, maybe a year. If you're on tour, then you come back square one again, have to have to find the next job. And it's a constant restarting of what we do. And and you're right. It, it's, uh, I, I think getting back to what you were saying before about being innate, that it is something that is just a, a character plus or flaw, however you want to see it in us, that we just keep going after the same brick wall, knowing that eventually <laughs> we'll break through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's something you can train or get better at? I, th I think it's something that you get used to. I think it's something that, you know, it, it, it may be a weird analogy, but, you know, whether you're a doctor or a police officer, you see a lot of, of horrible things. You see, you, you deal with death, you deal with people really struggling in those arenas. And, and certainly the interviews that I've seen, it seems like they, they, they never get used to it, but it is something that they learn how to process. And I think the same types of, of of heartache, trauma can happen as an actor, and you can you can you know be be put down. So, sometimes it's it's from horrible people. I've heard certainly spoken to guests on my podcast that have had horrible experiences with directors who treated them poorly or producers, and and so that certainly happens. And and that's something that I think. COVID really brought to light and hopefully theaters are addressing these inadequacies that have been happening. But in more, in just the more general sense, there is the, well, 
you know, your, your hair is too blonde or I'm sorry, you're too tall, which th these are things I've gotten. I've had the wrong hair color or I'm too tall. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's these things that we have no control over that can determine whether or not we get a job. And I, I, th I think once it happens, once you're kind of confused, but then as you see it happening more, you're like, oh, it has nothing to do with me. It is, it's not something to take personally. And I think that that's what I've gotten used to. It's not that the, the rejection is now easy for me to handle. It's more just now I am prepared for it. And it's like, I don't need to take it personally. They're not rejecting me, Patrick, and my skills, although sometimes I've had bad auditions. But overall, it is them saying, not now, not for this production. And I know that there will be the director that says, yes, now, yes, this production. And it's just a matter of finding that right director, that right role, that right show. Oh, that's amazing. So what's one, like, what's your, you've obviously spoke a lot about why you got into the arts and all that sort of stuff, but what's your favourite thing about the job of being an actor? <laughs> I mean, I, I would say selfishly it's getting to be the bad guy. I, th I think of all the roles that I like to play, I like to play the villain, the bad guy. I, I, I remember it was, oh, I love again, that answer. <laughs> right? It was, it was a, there was a regional production that I, I got to do of uh, Beauty and the Beast. I was playing Gaston. Now, now Gaston, he's just such an arrogant, pompous ass. And it's, he totally it, but it, is. <laughs> it is. But it's so much fun because I, I, I think in life, we, we often don't get to, to showcase that bad side of ourselves or the, the selfish part, you know, and so these kind of roles allow us to kind of bring out a naughty part of ourselves. And it, it can be fun and delicious in a way to to needle into these characters and annoy the, the you know, the other actors and the other characters. And, 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 and then, but I remember in that production, whenever I was guest on, and then he's finally pushed off the window and, and, and falls, the audience applauded and was like, yeah. And I was so I like in a weird way, I was so happy that they loved the fact that I was dead because it meant <laughs> I, I've done it. I did my job. I, I was so good at them hating me. They were ready to see me die. You know, so it, it's, it's, the, it's these, it's these kind of uh, journeys that you can go on that uh, are so far removed from who I am as a person. You know, certainly I have my, my stubborn, arrogant side, but you know, I try as a as a decent human being to put that in check, but Gaston gave me a chance to really just kind of let that flourish, and it was just a it was a joy to do. Oh, good. be I aware, totally love it. yeah, it's awesome, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, what would be one thing that you'd change about either the industry or your job? Well, I I mentioned it before that that COVID I think was a, a wake up call to a lot of theaters, a lot of producers, maybe directors and, and the way that we handle each other, the way we handle and approach this business. And, and so I think that there is a, a certain reckoning that is happening that is, that is due. But what I would caution against is saying that, well, it all needs to change, like, like theater is just bad. And, and, and I've heard this from some people that theater is just, it, it's just, it's not good. We, we need to progress more. We need to do, and, and while I'm not diminishing the fact that anything, any business, any person can improve and, and be a better representation of this art form, be, uh, you know, a better artist and handling and dealing with other people. At the same time, the theater has always been for this bastion of creativity and acceptance that people have found nowhere else, whether, whether it's because of your skin color, because of your sexuality, because of your, your upbringing, there are these different things. And I, and I talk to these guests all the time from various backgrounds and how they found a home in theater because there was an acceptance there. And I think that that is the core of what theater is and what it can be. There's an acceptance and no matter where you come from, you can still be a part of this community, this family of theater. And, and I think that while yes, certainly let's, let, let's improve what can be improved and, and bring in more voices that need to be brought in, but, but let's not lose sight of that acceptance and that 
home that theater has been for for decades, if not centuries, where it's been the outcasts. It's been the people who didn't couldn't find uh, a, a certain love, a certain uh, commonality with other people that they just couldn't find it anywhere else. And I think that as we as we go forward, as we begin again and bring theater back to uh, to to a place where it it is more diverse, it has more voices in it that we don't lose sight of that uh, of that central role of acceptance and family that theater can be. Well, that's a wonderful answer. I, I totally concur with that. <laughs> so, Patrick, if um, if people were wanting to contact with you, make contact with you, um, your website, your podcast, do you want to give a little bit of a plug about how people could find you? Yeah. So so the podcast, Why I'll Never Make It, is really available on, on most any platform. Uh, so you can look for it. You can search for it in there. Uh, there's also the website, why I'll never make it.com where you can see past episodes. And also there's some links to, to different podcast apps there for myself. Uh, I have my, my own website as well. Uh, Poe Jones, those are my initials P O J O N E S. So, uh, Pajones as it is in Spanish. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, pojones.com is how people can find me and, uh, you know, keep track of, of what I'm up to. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us today. That was amazing, Patrick. Yeah, a pleasure to talk to you both. Thank you for having me. Theater at Life is a global media site for entertainment. Memberships start at only 38 US dollars per year. You can have unlimited access to our daily published articles, including entertainment news and the writings of active industry professionals, ensuring that you are always up to date on the global happenings in the world of entertainment. Become a part of the international entertainment community and join us now at www.theaterartlife.com.